you want us to start or how does that work? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just, yeah, well, welcome to the session and, you know, uh, over to you, like just give a quick introduction to the topic and the uh, participants and then take this important topic. Um, I, I can say a few words to start just, but anybody else can, yeah. Uh, not pushing free. I um, I think the 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 topic uh, is overlapping with the topic of how does uh, cybersecurity talk to management or how does the CISO talk to the executive team? Uh, here it's a bit more specific because uh, based on the headline, it, we're talking about the uh, uh, the risk professionals, uh, but uh, in principle talking to uh, uh executive executive i would imagine is the executive team or could even be the board depending on the situation because the board has typically risk responsibility so it could probably is a two level thing uh, mm -hmm. one is the executive side and the other one is is the board and to launch a bit as a discussion and to make it a bit uh, kind of black and white where we can paint the gray levels later uh is uh in, in what I noticed in my consulting practice is that uh, you know uh, many CISOs or many senior guys or even risk professionals are typically uh, even the CISOs are very technical in many ways. Yeah, so they would be, and because most of the problems they have to solve are very technical. So sometimes they are part of IT, sometimes they're separate from IT. Uh, sometimes uh, they report the, this to the CFO or to someone. Yeah. Uh, they are uh, maybe one layer or two layer away from the executive management team. Yeah. And they are very often, uh, most of them very technical. Yeah. And uh, so the one of the big challenges is to talk the same language between uh, these two sides, yeah. One, the executive management does not understand the technical things, the technical guys doesn't understand the management things, yeah. So we, we have to find a way to talk uh, the same language. And I think, generally speaking, uh, it this the first step is uh, for the uh, the cybersecurity guy, the risk professionals, to acquire a bit of management know-how. I think you know, especially security costs a lot more these days. We have to behave like any other department in a company, having management uh, know-how, talking the same uh, language, understanding uh, the, the way the company is managed independently of technical area is uh, one uh, very uh, big thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, clearly education of the executive may be a topic by itself, what is practical, what is acceptable. Uh, on, on that height, depends a bit on the style of the company, is it a small company, medium-sized company, MNC, uh, what, what does it mean? I think that's uh, what I would say just to get the discussion going. A bit general, but we can go in the specific aspects. Um, I'm happy to just pick up on that. I think um, I think you you know you make some some very good points there, and I you know completely agree that there is an issue around uh, finding common language. And I and I you know one thing that I would throw out there is that I I've always felt that um, one of the issues is that boards, for example, um, think that cybersecurity is essentially a you know a technology or an IT conversation, and and they you know don't identify that as being uh, an area where they have expertise. And, and when you're on a board or you are a senior exec, you don't really like to show your vulnerabilities and lack of knowledge. So particularly when it's, you know, going down a specialist route, then actually that essentially means that they probably don't contribute as much as they would want to um, because they don't want to showcase that, that, you know, lack of knowledge or that vulnerability. And I think that part of the issue is that cybersecurity uh, from a board, from a board perspective, for example, or a, or an exco perspective, is not an IT conversation. It's not a technology conversation. It's a risk management conversation. And and when you, you know, change the chip in in a lot of these individuals, where you know you say to them actually it's a risk management conversation, and you would you would happily contribute to risk management in pretty much every area of the business, mm -hmm. regardless of whether you have expertise or not, then apply the same level of 
um, know-how and you know general management skill set etc that you would have in any risk management conversation and kind of go from there and you know like a very practical example for me is you know you want to protect the crown jewels of your organization from a cybersecurity perspective everybody wants that now the cybersecurity team or the security team will be able to do that but they're not the ones who should decide what the crown jewels are you know that really is is a decision for for the board or for exco so you know that is a, a good example for me where you have risk management uh, as, as a sort of overlay and then you mm-hmm. figure out you know what you can contribute towards that conversation and then you have different parts playing a role so i think one 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 item and i'm sorry to to, to oh, that to, was the end <laughs> that was the end of my yeah, i think the uh, some of you and i'm not sure which industries you are working so it may be a little bit different in uh, some of you who are at least in EU uh, will be, uh, who are, for example, in the financial industry, will fall under DORA regulation soon. Uh, and, you know, normally that's end of 2024, beginning 2025. And uh, uh, DORA specifies that the supervisor, the management body, which is basically both the executive team and the board, have to have the proper know-how. And I, I was facing even regulators uh, a year back, which in their audits brought up the point that the management needs to have the know-how, needs to be involved, needs to take the time. Uh, so, uh, and that's one thing. So I think the topic of, it's no longer it's no longer possible, at least for senior management to get away. It's now kind of black and white, you know, in, in, in some ways. And some of them, because of that, or the future or the present, have uh, chosen to get also advisors to to have the independent. The board can have an advisor because it's a bit independent on cybersecurity to help it in in some ways. That's one thing. The second thing is the uh, one of the problem is that the security guys sometimes may report to CIO or not. Sometimes even the CIO is not part of the executive team. So there is a number of topics, not only cybersecurity topics which are not necessarily well understood even at executive team level, depending on the company to throw more, more uh, oil to the fire. <laughs> so um, I would like to add a few things on this one. So um, um, first of all, I'm, my name is Maciek. I'm, I'm, I'm a technical architect. I'm, I'm working for one of the largest MSP providers in Oxford in the UK. And um, that's, what our job is on a daily basis, just to speak to obviously executives and and the right people within the within the industry. And as 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 Guy and Danny said, I think it's important um, to us to make sure that we speak into those executives, to the people who are make, actually making the decision, because um, you know security, data protection, and and all of those things um, that we're talking about, they, they actually start from the top. So obviously, people that we're speaking to, they they need to decide. Whether they want to, you know, go for the changes within within their business, and that's that, that, that that's where it starts from. So, so I think it's quite important, as, as Danny, as you mentioned, um, speaking to the right people at the top of the organization, because you know we know that it won't start from um, from from down, and then you know obviously everything starts from the top, and 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 the main decisions are are being made, you know, at the top. So, so this is why why this is so important to speak to someone who's who's actually who's actually making those decisions. Plus. Obviously, as, as as we we all know, and then you can probably all agree that we live in a crazy world at the moment where data um, needs to be super protected because you know with with all of those SaaS solutions and everything, we actually keep the data everywhere, and yeah, we need to have the right solutions to 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 you know to make sure that the data is is, is protected right. So so I think I think the main point is just to make sure that we're speaking to someone at the top of the chain who is making those decisions, and um, yeah. I think sometimes there's a few things I think sometimes overlooked, you know, when we're talking about, you know, there's a there's a lot of talking about CISO has to be technical, but at the same time, I think one thing that's overlooked more often than not is the soft skills. Because when you land yourself in a CISO position, the first thing and foremost, you should, you know, get to know your executive team. So you have to align your communication style, whether someone's technical, whether someone's managerial, how do you deliver your risk, you know, communication across various parts of the C C suite, you know? So you need to know how you can present stuff that they will understand, you know, align those, 
you know, communication lines align, you know, their knowledge and their perspectives, you know, the first thing I think, you know, when you get to meet them, ask, you know, what's, what's keeping them up, up at night, you know, how, how does the, you know, what kind of risks are in their particular area? Because when you get the buy-in and you can de deliver value to the executives, then you can build those communication lines and actually get something done. I think what what's happening also is that some CISOs and or risk professionals sometimes it's not only that it's not only the same common language and and it's sort of make it clear, but we there are other things which are lacking. The the senior guy, the, the executive may ask you, so where where is your security strategy? Do you have a document explaining where you want to go? Do you have a roadmap? Yeah. Do you have a uh, what are you do, you? do you have any KPIs? Do you have metrics? We can see we can see every month the update on the risks. See every how how are the metrics and the KPI you're doing and where you're going in in, in the future. I think it's it's a it's a kind of a, a mix of things we which are typical for a management discussion. There's nothing unique for security, but this is what they would ask anybody who would bring up something if you you know of, of interest in some ways. I think the the these in, these instruments or these these elements we must have to. To fit in uh, the, the the management, uh, let's say uh, logic in some sense. That's, that's why actually. I... Great. Great. Okay. Uh, well, I totally. I mean, in agreement with all that have been said so far. I mean, based on my experience, I mean, working with the executives from a, a governance, a GRC perspective. Um, so, based on the challenges that I've actually encountered dealing with. Um, the, the, the powers that be within this organization as it relates to um, risk communication, um, I have actually been able to develop a strategic approach to actually dealing with this challenge. Um, based on the fact that, the as you have rightly said, the executives have a particular mindset. They think a certain way. Um, so in order to deal with this, I normally approach this from a more strategic point of view. And I've actually developed a particular um, I would say maybe a system or that that I normally use to deal with this sort of a situation. Normally, I would, for example, ask, I mean, I need to first understand how do executives think? What is it that they're thinking about in a boardroom? How do they actually process? What are they communicating? What are the conversations that they have within these boardroom conversations? And then I need to understand, for example, how it is that the business generates revenue, I mean, the bottom line, what is it um, that actually contributes the most to the organization? And um, in terms of uh, how do they actually, what, what perspective do they have on risk? So with that alignment, with that understanding, then I'm able to align um, what it is that I'm communicating with their overall, I mean, business uh, activities within that organization. So. That is the way that I've actually been able to, I mean, proactively or positively being able to work with the executives to get them along, as you say, in terms of buying and um, understanding better from a, a cybersecurity perspective, risk perspective. And can I can I just building on that, um, you know, based on that experience, do you feel that you add as much value to them as they add value to you? Is it is it a real 50-50 two-way or is it more, you know, you're adding more value <laughs> or, or the other way around? Like, how would you see it? Well, I would say uh, depending, or, well, based on the environments that I've actually been in, I have actually worked along, it, it, it depends. Um, you have people that are really quite receptive. I mean, you have those that are like, I mean, they put curious as to what, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about they making, generating revenue, but I think it all depends based on my experience. It varies. At times it's a 50-50, at times it's more of maybe a 60-30. So th that's where really the challenge is. I have to bridge that gap to create that alignment to ensure that they're actually achieving. We're all on the same wavelength in terms of meeting business objectives. Yeah. yeah. I think also what you need is not all the executives. There may be, there may be of course, the, the, the CEO, the managing director, or the board, the chairman of the board, and so on. They... They, they, of course, there's a collection of individuals. All these individuals have different roles and their risk appetite is actually different. And what they want in life is very different. So it's also, you have to understand a bit, if you can, and you said talking to them, talking to them also helps to understand the politics 
going on. Yeah, uh, maybe for one, you are uh, one who is saving his job because to avoid that we have a breach. For the other one, you are basically a cost factor, <laughs> which has to be minimized. The other one may think that you disrupt, you could possibly disrupt the the, the processes of the company or something. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, I mean, I think having using any opportunity to expose yourself uh, to to work with them is uh, to understand them better, so to find uh, uh, the right angle. And the right, not only language, but also political angle uh, is really uh, is really important. I think that's the same amongst themselves for other topics. It's not unique to to cybersecurity. It is you have to navigate also. But I, I think the, uh, I think just sorry, just briefly okay. on that. I, I think the the issue there though is that that's when that's when you've got a problem, right? When you when you're working with a board or an exco that has an individualistic approach to what they're hoping cybersecurity is going to be, you know, and I think the, 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 ideally, you know, just based on what I've heard so far, like the whole point is that you have to work with the board to educate them uh, and create that 50, 50 relationship to make sure that there's only one mission. And then everybody's working to the same mission. Cause I think you, you, what you just said is so true. Like, you know, if you're a cost, if you're a cost concern for one and you're a savior for another, then, you know, like, how are you going to be able to bring everybody together? But if you have one mission that, that you know, that embodies everybody, then you've got something you can mm -hmm. work. And, and, yeah, I and I think if, if I could elaborate on this one also, I, I like what actually Marius said once, you know, we need to find that, you know, simple language first, you know, to, to speak to someone, because obviously, you know, the, the executives within the companies, they, they may not be technical. I mean, they don't need to be technical. Um, uh, and we just need to find the language, um, essentially, to create the documents. I mean, uh, one of the techniques that that that, that we're using and in the company that I work for is uh, we write, um, you know, those documents like strategies for the companies. And this is a non-technical language first, just to approach that conversation with those executives. And then obviously later on, we'll explain to them, you know, in technical matters, why this is important and things like that. But um, it's it's really it's really important to to at least at the beginning, if you know that you're speaking, as Marius said, you know, to someone who is not technical, just to explain them, you know, why this is important and just a simplest language as, as possibly can be um, so they can understand the risks. Yeah, I think once one thing that sometimes is missing, you know, uh, when we start communicating risk to the board, the, the great way and and when you obviously build on those soft skills you know you become a storyteller so because obviously you know most of the executives all they care about is the bottom line so how can you relate you know your risk mitigation tactics that it delivers to the business bottom line because sometimes you know we as security professionals tend to talk about you know specific critical risks but that does not mean anything to them unless it relates to bottom line and you know business goals and business direction so I think that's key in, in, in how you can create and craft your storytelling into that it delivers to the business bottom line. I think uh, adding to that, in the past, I, I came across many people who, who got the attention of the executives by fear. Yeah, If we don't do this, we're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that I think is okay. You can use that once or twice, but you cannot use that as your <laughs> typical model. You have to go beyond that. And I think understanding where you come in, where the, this particular risk impacts production, where it impacts customer satisfaction, where it impacts uh, the financial things. Uh, talking that language over time is is the better way. The fear works a little bit at the beginning. Uh, but I think also what I see is that most, and that may help in this discussion, most uh, uh, executives actually, or at least the most senior guys in the executives are, you know, they are aware that things go wrong. If things go wrong, uh, uh, they are going to be in the front line. On, 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 they're going to be visible, yeah? And so I think they are nervous these days. They are not. I think that was not the case two or three years ago. I think these days they are aware that it is their job, or they're 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 they 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 are uh, involved in in either avoidance and uh, also solving the problem and so on. I think, and I think that what they have in their mind is, you know, are we doing the right thing in this company? Yeah, that's what they have in their mind. Or are we investing enough? Yeah. Or uh, uh, and so on. Have we understood what's going on? They may not be tested technical specialists, but all the executives typically are very smart guys. Yeah, they may not be deep technical, but they 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 certainly can 
uh, or ask the right questions uh, up to us to be able to to uh, sort of feed them. I, I totally agree with you there. I'm actually seeing a shift um, where, um, the, as you mentioned rightly, that the, the executives are no longer, I mean, so I mean, archaic in terms of what they think. They are now more abreast with, I mean, cybersecurity happenings. They see the various um, breaches, incidents, the impact to the organization. So as you have rightly said, they are thinking about, are we safe? What can we do? So I normally take the advantage of that to build a relationship. That's one of my things that I normally do to try to um, build a strong relationship as best as possible wherever I can to ensure that we're actually communicating. So once we have that trust, we have that relationship where possible, and it's easier for me to actually communicate and bring the importance of um, ensuring that whatever it is that we are doing from a, a cybersecurity perspective um, is actually in the interest of the organization to ensure that they're operating securely as it relates to risk uh, mitigation. So, yeah. I'm going to ask a question, guys, and, and I wanted to see what you guys think, because obviously, you know, talking about risk, the problem we tend we to have in, in the cybersecurity industry is that we are usually in a firefighting mode. We discover risks, we build mitigation practices for how we're going to address the risk, and then we move on, and then we discover new risks. But I think the problem that's normally happens in the industry is that we never go deep enough to understand why specific risks are happening. Because if we go deeper and build those communication lines and address potentially business processes, business practices to, to prevent those risks from happening again, we probably deliver better value to the business. So what's mm -hmm. your guys' thoughts on that? I would think that uh, my experience is 50% of the risks we see are coming from bad guys who are creative for the new way to do something bad, yeah? 50% of the risk are typically created by the company internally based on what you said. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, they, they, they they are the quick way to organically develop IT applications in the past because they wanted to have a customer satisfaction. They want a quick, uh, quick results. And so there were a few shortcuts that or someone is easy going on on third parties because that's a way to do cost down. So let's let's do quickly. So, but but in principle, by not having the proper process or at least the minimum proper process or minimum due diligence, this this add to the risk. But they are risks which are produced by the company itself. Yeah, and I think uh, highlighting those and say, well, these ones we control. The other ones we have to work around the bad guys uh, you know new techniques uh, we, we 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 we're not in the driving seat but we certainly can be uh, try to protect ourselves uh, i would say 50 50 i would say i'm not sure that's a, just a ballpark but i think it's i think it's a very you know it's a it's a really good point actually because a lot of this you know as you as you said earlier is about you know the risk when it happens but a lot of work can go into defining risks, and and if you take the time, and if if you know boards and executive committees working with with cybersecurity professionals take the time to you know I don't know commission an audit of their digital estates, you know across all of their hardware, software, legacy systems, data, etc. I mean you know there's a lot of work, but the, but the more the more you do in terms of prep, you know the better the risk conversation is going to be down the line when when something happens. So I think you know a lot of this is you know if you're willing to invest jointly working together security professionals with ESCOs on actually defining risk, then you'll have a far greater chance of being able to deal with it when it emerges later on. Yeah, because I'm just I'm just kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, if you look at the statistics, every year we spend more and more on cybersecurity and we get more and more breaches. So like just to take a for example, if you take an application security program, normally what happens is we add more tools, we add more people just to try and solve all the vulnerabilities that we have. Yeah. But where the actual problem is, is our coding practices. So if we actually improved our quality of the code and the qu quality of the coding practices, we wouldn't need to throw money at the tools, at you know vulnerability discoveries and patching and, and all of that. So that, that's where I'm coming from in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
I think also what makes it a bit difficult, and it's basically a segregation of duty things. Sometimes in these meetings, you know, a security responsible risk manager or CISO cannot always say exactly what he's thinking. That is one problem. Because if he does say that, basically shoots the CIO in the leg, yeah? For example, you know, it's the same guy he has to work tomorrow with. And so it's about finding ways to, on the one, on the, on the one side, speak out and, and point the finger. But on the other hand, you, you, you know, to find the, let's say, quote unquote, the diplomatic way uh, to not, you know, not solve one problem and make another one tomorrow uh, out of it. So they have to, that's a bit, it's a bit politics, but you have to navigate in, in some uh, ways. Unfortunately, in most cases, in some cases, it's uh, the, that has that that psychological border has been you know, been uh, already overcome. But yeah. uh, I think I think that goes to the fact that you know I've been discussing a lot lately as well as this. You know, there are companies who need to understand the reasons for hiring a CISO. You know, I've been discussing a lot of job, dis you know, job descriptions where, you know, the, the the top line of the job description of a CISO is I need ISO 27001, I need SOC 2 type 2, I need PCI DSS, and that's all we need because, you know, or because, you know, another company told us, oh, we should have a CISO, but we, we you know, we haven't thought or we haven't thought about supporting lines. And that's why, you know, we there's many discussions about why CISO should not report to the CIO because, you know, there shouldn't be no politics games. You should be able to tell exactly to the executives what's wrong in the business. And if you need to play politics games, then it's it's wrongly set up and it's wrongly supported security function. I totally agree, but it's a bit company by company dependent. Yeah, yeah. you some things you change over time. It's not you have a given situation. I think when when you come in, but I, it's not uh, ideal. And I agree. That's why in my, in my my experience also separating. Uh, security from uh, from IT, from the CIO is uh, one important case because half of the problems come from IT typically. Uh, then uh, if they're not reporting to the CIO, to whom do they report? Yeah, uh, Do they report to the CFO or does he report to uh, a COO or a CTO? Uh, do we have at least an exceptional seat in the executive meetings or not? Uh, one has to also fight for that. So you have to fight in some sense or evolve in some sense. Uh, to to get to the, get the seat at the table and hopefully be there reasonably uh, you know you you should be able to reasonably speak your mind in, in yeah. sorry it will never be 100% but i think at least uh, get to be able to get the message in, in clear yeah what, what actually mario said you know it's it's quite interesting because he actually said you know more tools and more practices we we're using, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. And I've been in those conversations with 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 executives, whether whether they said to to, to me, um, you know, or to the team that I'm working with, um, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, we, we're not going to change this because, you know, obviously something will happen. But that's not the right conversation. I mean, you need to make sure that you're putting those tools in place. Again, um, as I mentioned previously, we live in a crazy world where, you know, obviously, you know, the bad guys will try to, um, you know, get get to the data, you know, within a company. So, um, yeah, we, we just need to make sure that those conversations are are proper conversations with with, with the businesses and the businesses are, are going for the right solutions. Um, Unfortunately, you come to the conclusion, and it's not a good one, uh, that uh, an occasional breach is helpful because it 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 resets <laughs> many of the bad practices in 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 some ways obviously nobody wants the bad things to happen but uh it makes this alignment uh, a bit faster if nothing has ever happened then anybody can say any anything uh for forever uh yeah. so. and and i think i think the the best sometimes what we can do is just to make sure that obviously it's it's a harder job for 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 the bad actors to you know to essentially steal steal the data you know or, or... Yeah, it's just about as well. It's, 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 a, it's a one piece about governance as well. You know, I've been talking with various executives as well. You know, sometimes it's it's funnily alluded as chief information scapegoat officer instead of, you know, chief information security officer. Because, you know, if you are highlighting things and especially back practices and, and specific risks against, you know, in your organization, how do you document that? How do you get, you know, exceptions? How do you get... 
acceptance of the risk because you have to make sure that this is documented because you obviously done your job whether executives you know accept the risk or whether they decide to mitigate that's up to them but how do you document that practice and making sure that it's it's obviously all evidenced that's another very important part of the job i i totally agree with i mean what you actually said there I mean, well, I think one of the greatest challenge as it relates to, I mean, based on what I've actually experienced so far in all of this in terms of uh, the communication is actually having to deal with the existing organizational culture. And at times having to find various practices to break this culture to actually um, make sense. Of the, getting a feedback, okay. So having, I mean, that, that that proper governance structure in place actually does, I mean, makes a difference as um, Marius is actually um, alluded to just a while ago. Yeah, I think culture is very important as well. You know, I, I've, I've talked to the executives where, you know, you can have a nice poster in the, in the kitchen that says we are a collaborative company, but, but if you are incentivizing only say one person and the best person in the team you're not going to get collaboration because only the best one's going to win so why would i collaborate with someone else so it's just it's always a top-down approach so how do you create a collaborative culture how do you involve everyone and i think that's what we kind of alluded as well so you know yes scare tactics and scaremongering works once or twice but third time, you're probably no longer invited to the table. You know, that's why it's been known, you know, security to be as a no sort of department. Mm -hmm. And actually, I said to my team the other day, I said, when did the last time we said no to the business? And nobody could remember because you, you can't do that because the more you say no, the less you are listened to. So how do we say yes, but can we do this with these particular specific security requirements in place? And, you know, instead of you know instead of using a stick using a carrot you know that how do we every because everyone extension essentially everyone in the, in your business is an extension of security team they will be be able to help and highlight specific risks specific you know malpractices if they are listened to supported and and welcome to highlight things yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think on, on the culture also is, you know, what we, I'm sure we'll all advocate, but, you know, celebrating successes and celebrating, you know, just just good instances where, I mean, you know, you, you never want to be able to, you never want to be in a culture where people feel like they could, they can't put their hand up in an organization because they might have identified a potential breach or whatever it might, you know, just anything that involves celebrating somebody making the right sort of decision or judgment or whatever it might be. I think you know top down uh, and 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 the inverse is is got to be is got to be the way forward so yeah i agree it's you know it's it, culture is is the very beginning of it all i think also uh, giving i mean certain problems you cannot solve in one day or one month it will take uh, one year two years three years so you have to a little bit announce a color here is short term things here's medium term it's things so you become predictable in some sense, it's not this will cost little money, this will cost more money, and, and so forth. So I think that's okay. It's, it's what everybody would do in a company, and, and we have to do that too. You know, our, certain problems cannot be solved easily. I mean, obviously, you have a burning thing, you solve it. Yeah, I'm not saying that. The second thing is, uh, you you have to come to a point where you, your opinion is trusted. Yeah. Because you cannot every every day you have another problem. You cannot ex in a day by day explain in detail, detail, detail. So at some point you have to come to the situation where your opinion and, and your your advice is trusted, because time is running. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and you can you 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 know you have to do things on the ground. You cannot you you need to be able to be in a situation where people take you know they can ask a few questions, but in general they would trust your. Uh, your advice in some ways, knowing that you are not unrealistic or unreasonable in what you ask. I think that is also a point you have to reach so that, you know, things move on, yeah, because, uh, you know, you can solve one problem today and be killed tomorrow, yeah, so you have to, <laughs> you have to make sure that uh, things uh, move on, showing the direction over time, your opinion is trusted after a while, maybe at the beginning is a bit harder, uh, make sure that you you solve day by day problems and and uh, you know you you because 
if you say things and tomorrow something stupid happens somewhere else, you 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 you, you know, yeah. your trust you know, is, 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 is affected in, in some ways. And and also, I, I think it's it's really important to um, to segregate, you know, the issue well the issues within the, within the businesses and just you know sort of highlight which issues are more urgent and which ones need to be remediate you know much faster than the others and as as, as i think maris you, you've mentioned that um, obviously how, how do we track those changes and things like this when we have those conversations with people and i think again from from my experience we we, we keep the documentation so for example you know if we if we create the document for, for for the businesses this document may be for another 18 months or, or you know 20 months you know so you know over almost, almost a two-year um, you know, going forward, the, the the roadmap, and then obviously we mark the urgencies of changing the the, the segmented issues. And then again, if we have a conversation with that executives or with a company in next two years, something hasn't been done, but again, something has happened within that segment. Um, then obviously that that that's the that, that that's that's the issue. But at least you know we've mentioned that in the past, and and I think that that's how the conversation should should also. Um, be sort of you know um, approached as well, just just to seg seg segmented those issues, making sure which ones are more important than the other. And again, every company is different, and and that's why that's why that's why it's important to speak to someone who knows the culture within a company, you know, um, who know how how the people work within that company. And and again, it's important also that the businesses are not afraid, you know, that, that the individuals are not afraid to say that something has happened within a business. Because as, as Danny, as you said, you know, um, that you've been working with a couple of companies that, you know, someone was scared to to raise their, their hand and say, okay, something has happened because they, they, they've been afraid that they, they may be punished, you know, for, um, for, for whatever happened. But um, yeah, I, I think it's important to, to, to segregate, seg segmented those and, and making sure which ones are more urgent than the others and, and just approach it this way. I think sometimes as well, talking about risk, I think the one thing that sometimes is really missing is we get to the fact of addressing risk at very local sort of level and sometimes you need to look at you know at macro and and context because normally you know nowadays we the more you know gen ai is obviously a different conversation but obviously we are getting more tools and more data points where we can make more accurate decisions about risk about the context about business you know what's happening in macroeconomic level so hopefully with the time going we can make better decisions moving forward to understand the context in where the business is operating what are specific risks to that business within their own you know environment and but but also with a bigger sort of economic scale on what's happening i think one one thing i can recommend uh, in general because it, you you know in my case i was facing in the past i was facing the management the board but also I was facing many, many different business units, which had also very a lot of independence. It's not like it's only just the top, but also uh, horizontally, you can see. I think one thing which always helped is that, uh, and it was an investment decision, is to invest in analytics. Yeah, I, 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 I was able to invest a percentage of my budget to build analytics. Again, I could show numbers to everybody. Numbers uh, per month, uh, numbers evolution, numbers per business unit. Uh, who is doing better? You can say, "Oh, this one is doing very bad. This one is doing well." It, it's very powerful to compare in the same company uh, to different behaviors. So, but the numbers don't come easily. Yeah, you, know? you have to have uh, building an analytics system. It takes one year, two years, three years. You have to have a bit of an idea where you go because the data is all over the place. You have to measure it. You have to build it. You have to put meta layers above it so that you can represent data. But it is it is one of the guaranteed, I would say, hundred percent or ninety nine percent sure way to get the return of investment in terms of uh, moving away from judgments only and 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 substantiating uh, things. And the the numbers are very powerful, especially when you compare behaviors uh, between divisions. Yeah, because someone says, "Well, what you ask is unreasonable," but then you show the numbers. Well, this one did it already, and you are not doing it. Uh, inside the company, comparisons is very powerful. Uh, versus just saying, "Oh, something is wrong." Yeah, if you yeah. can show someone has already solved the problem and here's the numbers, and someone has a has not, and here's the numbers, 
this takes away a lot of the problematic things, especially when you have many business units horizontally. Yeah, and I think that feeds into risk monitoring because sometimes, you know, I've, I've been, I witnessed, uh, you know, facts where, you know, we have a specific, say, risk. We developed a mitigation plan for that risk. We mitigated risk to an acceptable level. Yes, we did that at this point in time, but sometimes organizations or some specific risk professionals tend to, when you mitigate the risk to an acceptable level, that risk is closed. But if you don't have an adequate monitoring, how do you, because this is a point in time exercise, how do you know what's the risk output or the risk measurement within next three, six, 12 months, 18 months, that mm -hmm. risk might completely change and that mitigation might not be adequate anymore in a time frame. So the monitoring of the risk and, and you know, and constant evaluation is very important. You know, it's some, some regulations ask you to do a risk assessment every 12 months, but you have to gauge in your risk appetite where specific risks might need to be, you know, measured and assessed more often than, than, you know, every 12 months. Yeah. hundred percent agree with this because again, like, you know, the, the plan for the businesses at this point may not be the same within the next 12 months. So, so constant conversation with, with, you know, with the businesses, with executives, I think this is, this is quite important as well. So, so you need as a business to schedule those conversations every sort of, you know, six to 12 months. Um, because again, what, 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 what you said, and I completely agree with this, um, the plan of action for today may not be adequate, you know, within the next 12 months, because again, the organization grow, um, the, 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 you know, the, the, the cybersecurity may change, you know, the, the, the threats may change, the, the, the system obviously is going to be outdated within that, that time. Like th there, are, there are many, many factors that, that, you know, that, that, that has an impact on that. So, so scheduling those conversations within, you know, the, the, the right people within a business, it's, it's hundred percent crucial. I had uh, two, two examples. I had one case where someone, one managing director uh, took one new risk every year as a focus for the, and he, he, he wanted reporting. How is everybody doing on that risk? Yeah. And we of course have to still take care of the previous year things, but it was instead of going all directions, he, his way of thinking was, well, we have to take an objective every year, one single or two objectives. And we solve that one. And we add it to what we solved the years before. And this way we, instead of having to talk 25 different things or 25 different risks, there was a focus on getting a deeper understanding per risk uh, for one year. And then this was hopefully understood and we could move on to the next risk the next year. Next that year. was one way which uh, uh, made it very clear. And he wanted details uh, per business unit, per department, how we were doing on that risk. Uh, it was one way uh, to uh, move uh, uh, forward. I'm not saying it's the only way. Sometimes you have no choice, but if you have the choice, uh, uh, having focus points for management, say this year we focus on this, next year we focus on that. Of course, you choose the important ones in, in some ways where you, and, and we would get management support to solve that risk more than any other year or any other way. That's one uh, management technique, if you want uh, to to move on, I think. I think I, I I actually quite like that. It's uh it's uh I like it. It's novel. It's interesting. Um, different way of looking at it. I, I do think though that it's important that the cyber risks are very much part and parcel of the you know the overall red amber green risk management framework that any uh, exco or board has because you know the likelihood is that the cyber risks are going to be right up there. Um, and they're gonna, they're going to be you know I think then executives suddenly realize that out of you know six top risks two or three are cyber related and you know it really elevates the importance of the conversation as a as a result when you're able to compare the risk within the rest of the risks that the organization faces and not see it as a as a separate one so i think i think bringing it as as, as i say as part of the overall risk management framework is really important yeah yeah because sure. i think i think security you know as as we kind of all know security can't happen in a silo and i think sometimes as we discussed, you know, previously, you know, it's it's often seen as IT issue, but when you start expanding security into, you know, any department, there is specific security system, security risks that everyone faces, whether it's HR, whether it's, you know, business development. And, you know, I think you, we as security professionals has a way to, we need to expand and 
go beyond IT, you know, and i am always been a proponent, for example, you know, how do we deliver value, you know, because I've been discussing as well in my previous post, you know, normally, you know, we're not, a, we, tr how do create a narratives where security is not a cost center, security is a business enabler. So how can we, you know, I've, I've created slides as well for my business development guys about, you know, how do we do security well for our proposal customers that, you know, it's safe for uh, their for for their customers to hold data with us. How do we deliver business value for our potential clients? So you know, expanding that security sort of vision across various departments can really transcend how you deliver value as well as address risks. I, I think that is such a good point, Marius. I mean, the you know the um, the enabling that you just talked about because you know I, I'm sure we've all seen a whole bunch of presentations where uh, you know executive teams say, okay, item one, digital strategy, item two, cybersecurity strategy. And you're like, no, like the cybersecurity is the enabling part of your digital strategy. Like, you know, don't, don't separate it. And I, and I, and I think that's that sort of, you know, positive, you know, good cybersecurity means growth, means greater revenue, means greater opportunity, et cetera. That, that, that's what it's all about as opposed to, you know, let's have a separate session to talk about how we protect stuff. So I, I completely agree with yeah. you. Yeah, and, and I think that's why that's why I, I lately been, you know, focusing, you know, because we keep talking about security, security, but if we can transcend security into talking about as quality function, whether it's code, whether it's our IT infrastructure, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, uh, protecting our brand reputation, the more we build quality, with security in mind, the better we deliver business value. I think you can you can position security under the logo enabled business in an unsecure world. If you take that as your headline, uh, it, it, it makes uh, the discussion a little bit easier. But it is true that, you know, depending on the business and the business challenges, you know, it's someone may be willing to take a hit somewhere if that makes the business move faster. Yeah. Uh, you know, a security incident doesn't cost necessarily hundred million, but it could, but maybe an incident cost, cost us 40,000 or 50,000. Someone say, well, okay, losing money is never good, but it's something we can accept <laughs> because yeah. if we would find a way around it, it, it would make things more inefficient. We may lose more. So, having a good discussion like that gives us a feeling okay where what the priorities are we have also i had also cases where certain top executives had go and no go things they were very sensitive to certain topics uh, and zero tolerance for uh, certain things and they would be very much willing to have a like that a, a money discussion uh, on others so i think that is also important that it's uh, finding out to, because it gives you also priorities, you know, and avoid even for CISO, it does avoid that you go run in all directions. But the yeah. other one is when you look at, for example, CRM systems, I had cases like when we investigated, we found out that there's, let's say, a million records in the CRM system. Yeah. Only 20% get email links. The other ones are just uh, registered, registered, written. Nobody does everything. So we said, please, if you do not, if you do not do anything with the 80%, please take some offline. Yeah. Uh, we only should protect things which have economic value, which is obviously only the 20%. Uh, that is a change is totally the direct the discussion. Discussion, of course, they are a bit shocked why we collect so much and we use a little. Okay, that 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 discussion has to be done. But at least there's a logic, uh, a logic to it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think sometimes some other things as well, you know, what we alluded in in the beginning is. You need to understand the business because the risk mitigation, the risk framework, the risk appetite will change as depends on your organization. So if you walk into a bank, they're obviously going to be very risk aware and they're obviously going to risk a lot less. Where if you walk into a startup and you're trying to grab as much of the market share as possible because you just created the new product, you're going to you're going to create more risks and you're going to do more risk because you want to grow fast and you want to grab as much of the market when you reach a certain maturity level your risk appetite will change so you need to be aware of of business context and where you are in that maturity sort of scale i think in some cases you when you study your risk equation you have to solve it whatever it is maybe when the organization is bigger but sometimes when the organization is smaller smes or other smaller you have to first simplify the risk equation before you solve it I think don't don't you know if otherwise they cannot afford it they cannot 
sustain it in in some sense if you if you have uh, 25 images on your endpoints and you have to do vulnerability management and patching you're going to kill yourself possibly <laughs> unless you know you're helped in some way so sometimes you have to uh, find a way to simplify the equation first and then solve it and uh, not uh, apply big money to solve the wrong problem that's i think that also give give the executive feeling that you are thinking about you know uh, uh, common sense and practical economical ways to solve things. Yeah, sure. And um, just to add to that um, important point is um, one of the things I normally do is always to identify going back to the basics. How does this organization, how does this business actually generate revenue? What are my business assets? Not everything within the organization generates uh, um, uh, revenue or contributes to that overall per, um, revenue generation. So I always have my business assets. What are the risks to those business a uh, assets? I mean, what are the cyber risks to the business? I mean, what are the likelihood that some that risk can actually affect the business? I mean, what is that? What's what's the associated cost? I mean, if if that risk actually affects the business, and what's the cost to fix it? So I always operate within that line. I mean, in terms of simplifying my risk communication, always keep it as simple as best as possible um, for the, the executives to actually understand. So whatever it is, always align return on investment. Always go back to revenue generation. In, in another way, I have seen some people who have been thinking, okay, I have... And it's a reflex. I have hundred thousand dollar or euro in my pocket, and I will solve this problem by using hundred thousand or ten thousand. Yeah, and because that you know you're given a budget, you you have to stay within it and you have to solve it. And there's sometimes a wrong reflex also that instead of going to the right people and says I need a million to solve this problem, because this is a very very big problem. Uh, this sometimes is not done, yeah. So we we we're, we're kind of educated or trained or conditioned, <laughs> and uh, it's also not only means the CISO, but even the layers below may think in this way, or they say, okay, I have I have to I have to manage within that level. So sometimes the risks don't come up properly, also this way, because some says, well, you know, I know it's a risk, but okay, I'll, I'm going to use my ten thousand dollar to solve it as much as I can, rather than bringing it up. And uh, and uh, and uh, have the CISO ask a million dollar to fix it, or something like that. I think there's a, another big problem I, I see in, in in this risk communication. I think we go a couple of minutes left. So, any any final thoughts from you guys? I think communication, culture, and enablement are, are you know some of the words that really stick out for me over the last over the last hour. Anyone else? But say final final words. No, I would just yeah, I agree with Danny. What Danny says now, you know, those those three key points, and obviously speaking to the right people in the organization, that that's the key point as well. The the, the ones that that understand, you know, the um, the culture. How the organization works and just yeah just just to sort of those risks I, I was living in a japanese company and in a japanese company you you know just difference maybe of an american company you would not go to a meeting to have a debate the discussions happen individually before the meeting yeah <laughs> So, uh, because you, it's not it's not possible to have an agreement on with 10, 12 people possibly, but it's possible to discuss in depth, frankly, with individual members uh, beforehand and to try to move to a reasonable consensus when the formal meeting is happening, which is more formal or ceremony in some sense. That's a Japanese way of doing it. It's not, you don't expose anybody publicly, you don't, uh, don't attack someone publicly. But you spend a lot of time uh, in the preparation of the meeting with different individuals to get their point of view, to explain your point of view, which you can do typically in a much more frank way 
uh, uh, beforehand so that you can crystallize a, a proposal where you get a majority support at the end. Uh, that's uh, But that's uh, the culture of a Japanese company versus maybe others. Yeah. And I would say it's very important as well. We we'll discussed, um, get to the bottom of the problem. So, you know, I don't remember which book it was, but it said, ask five, five why questions to get to the bottom of, and the root cause of why things are happening. Because, you know, we need to move away from firefighting into being proactive risk addressing function that can deliver business value and what we just discussed being a business enabler so i think that's very very important so uh, but i would say that the, the, the one of the, the very important points coming from this is actually spending that time to understand how it is that the the executives actually think um as uh marius rightly mentioned I mean, what actually keeps them up? What is that they're thinking about? What's of importance to them as it relates to an organization overall? I mean, productivity. Um, so yeah, that, those those are the key points that I think I have actually gained from this, this conclusion. Brilliant. I think that's pretty much it. Thank you, guys. And we Thank you so much.